Hello there, and today we're going to be looking at the Renaissance, a period of incredible cultural and artistic flourishing taking place on the Italian peninsula roughly from the 1350s to the 1530s, anywhere from the, beginning, from the end of the Black Death in 1351. Uh, it also includes Patriarch being crowned as Italy's poet laureate in 1341, to Charles V's sack of Rome in 1527, perhaps even to Michelangelo's death in 1564. And here's one of my favorite sculptures, Lao Kun and his sons, carved around 150 BC. It's a Hellenistic sculpture of the Trojan priest Lao Kun, who tries to urge his fellow Trojans not to accept the giant horse that they found outside the gates of the city of Troy. However, Neptune, does not want the city of Troy to survive any longer, and he sends these massive serpents to come and devour Laocoon and his sons. It's an example of Hellenistic art, meaning that it was produced after the conquest of Alexander the Great, and uh, as in line with he uh, Hellenistic art, um, the scene is marked by incredible emotion and intensity. You can also see just the incredible attention to detail um, on Lao Kun and his sons. Notice like the rib cage, the veins going down Lao Kun's arms, and also just the look of absolute agony on Lao Kun's face as he's being devoured. As a work of art, few uh, examples from the Hellenistic world uh, just display such emotion, um, uh, emotion intensity, and uh, just incredible technique in terms of the craftsmen, in terms of the artists who were able to put this sculpture together. Let's look at an example of a sarcophagus, just real quick. A sarcophagus is literally an eater of flesh. It's basically a casket in which bones were deposited, and uh, you know, similar to say like a coffin or something like that, and wealthy Romans would commission grand sarcophagi um, in order for them to be interred in, you know, once they died. Um, this was probably designed by <clears throat> like a large uh, kind of workshop, maybe designing like a bunch of these, and then we're going to fill in details like this face right here um, to make it look like the person who commissioned this particular sarcophagus. This particular work of art is from 190 AD, and it, as a uh, terms of like a sculpture, architectural, artistic form. It's called a relief carving. Basically, you start with a massive hunk of marble, and then you take away bits of that marble so that the figures like these then emerge from what was just a solid block of, of marble. You're slowly taking away material so that you've got um, a figures like these um, that are still, you know, that are uh, starting to come out of it. Um, the deeper you carve, these figures, the more freestanding they end up becoming. So this scene here is a battle scene. Obviously, it was commissioned by a Roman. You can see 190 AD. Um, at this point, uh, the Roman Empire has just barely reached its peak in terms of territory. Um, still very powerful, stretching from Spain to Syria, from Scotland down to North Africa. And um, this particular scene here definitely reflects the interest that the Romans have in martial glory and in combat. It's a very chaotic battle scene. We see a noted shift in the medieval period. Obviously one of the biggest changes during the medieval period is the birth, the spread, in some ways the conquest of Christianity over the Roman Empire. When Constantine converts to Christianity in 312 AD after the Battle of the Melvian Bridge, um, much of the empire will convert to Christianity as well because, I mean, uh, for practical reasons, I mean, some people just want to get into it with the emperor, but long-standing changes as Christianity goes from a persecuted religion, as it was during the 100s and 200s AD, up to the dominant religion of the Roman Empire after Constantine's conversion. And just one thing that I find really interesting about this sarcophagus, the Good Shepherd sarcophagus, you can tell that it's, you know, it's the same type of art form as the sarcophagus that we looked at 200 years earlier than this one. This one's coming from the 4th century, but it's after the um, conversion of Constantine. It's after the empire has become largely Christian. So you can see that this particular sarcophagus has Christian subject matter to it. In this case, it's depicting Jesus Christ, who's here in the center holding a lamb. Um, the figures are carved in the same style. They're carved in relief. 
um, it just so happens that it's a Christian uh, uh, subject matter. So here, 4th century AD, we've got a marble sarcophagus with figures who are carved in roughly the same style as uh, the sarcophagus that we looked at before, but the subject matter is becoming Christian, uh, focusing on Jesus and stories from the New Testament. Now, one thing about Christian art in the medieval period is initially when it's uh, closer to the days of the Roman Empire. Say, like with this particular example, this is a mosaic called the Miracle of the Loaves and Fishes. It's uh, found in Ravenna, Italy, and it's made in 504 AD. Um, there is attention to real physical details. Like if you look at any one of these figures here, um, in the center here is Jesus, and he's surrounded by his disciples. Um, these definitely look like real figures, don't they? Don't they? They're anatomically correct. There is um, some uh, careful attention paid that the figures look different, right? The noses look different on each figure. Um, some figures have beards. Jesus' clothing is remarkably different from some of the other figures here. Jesus looks remarkably different from some of the other figures here. Um, even the background, right, you've got green tiles to represent, you know, the green grass that they're stepping on. Look at the feet. Feet are remarkably difficult to render in an artistic painting, but these are done pretty well. But if you notice in the background here, we've got a gold mosaic. Gold doesn't exist as a background in real life. You know, this isn't like a landscape or maybe a building of some kind or another. Rather, this particular background here is meant to be spiritualized and uh, idealized. Uh, medieval art is really meant to remind you of stories from the Bible and of spiritual truths like the existence of God and his care and his mercies. So these figures are certainly modeled on real people and they're realistic, but um, you can see that trend going towards uh, works of art that are more spiritual, that are more idealized, that are more kind of in some sort of heavenly, ethereal realm. The word ethereal means like heavenly, um, rather than in the world that you and I live in now. And this trend towards artwork that is more spiritual and idealized is... Uh, demonstrated very well by this mosaic from the Hagia Sophia. If you remember, the Hagia Sophia is the most beautiful, it's one of the largest churches in, uh, in, the, in Europe. It's in the city of Constantinople. It's built by the Emperor Justinian. Uh, this here is a mosaic, much like the mosaic that we saw in the previous slide here. But all these figures are idealized here. Um, certainly there's some attention that's paid that the Virgin Mary... Uh, looks like a real person. Um, this here, the baby Jesus here in the center. I'm not sure if the artist used a real baby to model the baby uh, to model this particular depiction of Jesus. After they may have, they may not have. I'm not sure. But the whole scene here is very spiritual and idealized. Um, on either side, uh, flanking the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus, you have um, the Emperor Justinian. You can see here he's literally offering the Hagia Sophia to the Virgin Mary and the Christ child as an offering. And obviously that scene didn't take place in real life. This is just meant to be symbolic of him offering up this church in honor of uh, the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. And same thing with the Emperor Constantine on the other side. He's literally offering up the city of Constantinople to the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus. Um, on these figures here, there's certainly some attention paid to rendering them as artistic works. But um, there's no, for instance, no use of perspective in this work. Perspective is the illusion of depth and distance in a work of art. And you don't have this here. Um, all four figures in this mosaic are all flat. Um, they're presented flat against this gold background. The gold background is very spiritual and idealized. Um, this, so this particular work of art that we see here shows very well that spiritual and idealize that heavenly sort of artwork of the Middle Ages. Because by and large, that artwork is meant just to remind you of you know, stories from the Bible, uh, God's existence, God's kindness. They're not meant to draw your attention back to anything on earth. They're meant to remind you of spiritual things. Now, I think we're in a good position to move into Renaissance art.
So we saw in the ancient world, uh, artwork is characterized by a focus on individuals. Most of the subject matter is from Greek mythology, like Laocoon, or maybe cool battles, um, stuff that, that glorifies Roman soldiers. In the medieval period, we have some of the same techniques being used early on, um, but the subject matter is becoming distinctly Christian, and we see also that artwork is becoming less realistic and more spiritual. Uh, so, with that in mind, let's look at this first painting by Giotto di Bandone, who is a Florentine painter who's considered to be a very uh, significant, uh, significant figure, and he's a bridge between medieval artwork and Renaissance artwork. So this particular painting is called The Lamentation or the Morning of Christ, and it's in the Arena Chapel in Padua. It's an example of a fresco. Fresco, in Italian, means fresh. So what they would do is they would take wet plaster and they would paint on it. When the paint dried with the plaster, it would fuse into one very cool, beautiful, uh, beautiful scene. Um, so this uh, particular work here, it's after Jesus has been taken down from the cross. So we can see the continuation with medieval artwork. Since the subject matter is Christian, if you remember on some of the previous examples, um, the figures, especially Jesus and the Virgin Mary, they had gold halos behind their heads. You can see this here between all of the figures around Jesus, his disciples, his followers, some of the, lady, some of the women who would follow Jesus during his earthly ministry, um, all of them have these gold halos behind their heads to signify who they are. So that does give us some uh, nice continuation with medieval art. There is a huge break though with Renaissance art, particularly in the use of perspective. Perspective is the attempt to create the illusion of space on a two-dimensional surface. And Giotto here is attempting to do that. By making some of the figures, like these angels, smaller, he's in effect putting them in the background. It creates an illusion of distance on an otherwise flat surface. And this is one of the main uh, dis distinguishing uh, di uh, distinctions between medieval and Renaissance artwork. That Renaissance artwork is going to be more like the real world. Continuing on, let's take a look at Sandro Botticelli's La Primavera, which in Italian means spring. It was commissioned in 1482 and uh, by Lorenzo um, Lorenzo and Giovanni de Pier Francesco de Medici was the cousin of Lorenzo the Magnificent. Lorenzo de Medici was a great patron of the arts in Florence. He was the head of the incredibly successful Medici banking family um, and the unofficial but de facto ruler of the city of Florence. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici financially supported a number of great Renaissance painters, um, including Botticelli. Uh, this is a really beautiful work of art. Certainly, but the first thing you should be able to tell about this is its subject matter. Uh, we've got figures from Greek mythology rather than figures from the Bible like Jesus and the Virgin Mary. Here the scene is dominated by Venus. She's the goddess of love and desire in Greek uh, Greco-Roman mythology. Um, this is reflective of the Renaissance interest in uh, Greek mythology and Greek literature, as opposed to just focusing on the Bible alone. You can see this remar remarkable shift as um, they're beginning to grow more interested in some more ancient sources of learning and wisdom. Um, chief amongst those uh, sorts of values from the Greco-Roman period are going to be balance and harmony. Uh, the Greeks were very concerned with order and symmetry, and then everything, uh, at the very least, appeared to be balanced. Uh, that was a mark of beauty and completion. In this particular uh, work here, you can see Venus is in the center, and she's balanced by the graces on one side, and then Flora and Zephyr and Chloris on the other side here. And the whole uh, painting is meant to be an allegory, uh, symbolizing the lush growth that occurs each spring. Literally, in this portion of the painting, you've got the god Zephyr associated with cold winds blows a goddess named Chloris and transforms her into the goddess of spring. The scene is taken from Ovid's Metamorphoses. So again, a work of art 
to, in the medieval period would be wholly focused on the Bible, whereas artwork in the Renaissance is beginning to branch out more and more and include figures from other you know, sources, other traditions. Here we have Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Uh, it was painted from a period from 1495 to 1498. Leonardo spent three years painting this scene on the wall at the Santa Maria della Grazia, a Dominican convent in Milan. Um, he spent an especially long time just looking at a blank wall um, at this uh, convent in Milan. Some of the monks there even complained that they had paid Leonardo to paint this wonderful work and uh, he just wasn't getting along with it. But he was imagining what the scene must have looked like when Jesus told his disciples that one of them was going to betray him that night. Um, this particular artwork does show some of the same interest in, um, in the Bible and themes and figures from, uh, from, uh, from Christianity, but it also shows that uh, remarkable uh, focus on uh, individuals that we see in the Renaissance. So this particular artwork is so famous because uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, is able to reflect like real human emotions in this painting so well. Um, you can tell that this particular figure here is Judas, the disciple who's going to portray Jesus, because unlike some of the other disciples here that have you know, gotten very, very worried about what Jesus has just said, that one of them is going to betray him. Judas is the only one who looks, you know, kind of silent. Look at him scowling here. Everybody else in the scene um, is displaying, you know, as looks very upset and emotional. But Judas, the figure who would betray Jesus, who's, you know, been plotting this for, for a long time anyway, he's the only one who's calm, right? Like a guilty man. Um, this particular artwork is noted, too, for its use of the vanishing point. Um, this is a way that you could create distance in a work of artwork by having all the lines in a painting converge on a single point, roughly here behind the head of Jesus. If you were to um, draw lines along all of the architectural details in this particular work, they would all end up behind um, Jesus' head here in the center of the painting. Continuing on with other works of art, we can look at an example of Renaissance sculpture. This is another favorite of mine. It's Michelangelo's La Pieta. Uh, in Italian, that just means the pity. Um, made from 1498 to 1499. This depicts um, the Virgin Mary holding the body of Jesus after the crucifixion. It's one of the most iconic uh, sculptures of the Renaissance. Um, you can see here um, examples of realism, right? These are real figures here. This is very similar to the statue of Lao Kun. I mean, you can see Jesus' ribs here. You can see his stomach muscles here. You can see the taut muscles in Jesus' arms, right? This is definitely a real person that Michelangelo modeled the sculptor, sculpture after. Also, you can tell the areas where the Virgin Mary's fingers are pressing in um, to the cloth that Jesus' body is wrapped in. So really incredible attention to detail that this particular figure here, uh, the body of Jesus, um, and the drapery even, um, would look as realistic as possible. The face of, the, of Mary, the mother of Jesus, is still um, idealized and very heavenly. Um, it's more the face of, say, you know, a younger girl, not a mature woman who has given birth to children. Um, this is a little bit more idealized. Um, something that looks a little bit more youthful and serene as if as Mary is holding the body of Jesus in her arms, she's contemplating the significance of Jesus' death. Um, you can also see he includes the nails were, that were driven into Jesus' hands. I mean, again, just the attention to detail is really incredible. Uh, one thing in particular, too, is the drapery here. Uh, this is an incredibly hard effect to render in marble, um, but obviously Michelangelo, being an incredibly talented figure that he is, um, is able to render something as hard and unforgiving as stone, as soft little bits of cloth. Going along with the Renaissance emphasis on individualism and humanism, 
Um, this is one of the first works of art that's going to have a person's name attached to it. Um, when Michelangelo had finished La Pieta and it was on display in Rome, he heard a lot of people mistakenly attribute La Pieta to another artist. Um, Michelangelo's ego would not allow any other artist to receive credit for his work, and so he broke into the chapter, chapel and carved his name across the sash, across the sash over the uh, body of Mary, uh, pictured here. So, but again, just an incredibly beautiful work of art. Here's another iconic uh, work of art from the Renaissance. It's the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, 1505. Uh, this particular work of art um, took him an incredibly long time for him to, to finish um, in terms of like all the detail that he put into this relatively simple painting. Um, it's one of the first and more prominent examples of landscape painting, uh, wherein you've got a real, although kind of idealized uh, uh, background um, in front of this figure. Um, and this is noted for a particular technique called sfumatu. Um, if you look here, Mona Lisa's hair seems to fade into the background, and it allows tones and colors. This particular technique allows tones and colors to shade gradually into each other. Here's another iconic work from the Renaissance. This is Raphael's The School of Athens. It's a fresco that's in the papal apartments in the Vatican. Um, this particular work of art is uh, basically shows all of the prominent philosophers from the Greco-Roman world on one side of the papal apartments. On the other side, you've got prominent Christian theologians in a work of art called the La Disputa. But these, those two works, the School of Athens and La Disputa, both of whom are by Raphael, um, demonstrate the, uh, em the belief in the Renaissance that uh, Greek culture, Greek mythology, Roman culture, and Roman literature are powerful means of finding truth, almost equal to the, to the, word, to the words available in Scripture. And now let's go ahead and take a look at perhaps the most famous example of Renaissance art, Michelangelo's fresco, frescoes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. There, he completes them over a period of four years from 1508 to 1512, and the Sistine Chapel ceiling is a massive architectural space. In addition, the style of painting are frescoes. If you remember, a fresco is um, a painting that's done on wet plaster, so that as the plaster dries, the painting dries with it, and so they form kind of like, you know, the painting fuses into the wall itself. So Michelangelo had to work quickly on such a huge space. The scenes on the Sistine Chapel depict stories from the book of Genesis, the creation of the heavens and the earth, the creation of the sun and the moon, the light and the darkness, the creation of Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden, as well as the story of Noah and the flood. It's really a breathtaking series of paintings that Michelangelo was able to complete. It's one of those great marvels of just human achievement. And the most amazing thing about it is the way in which Michelangelo incorporates Renaissance humanism and Renaissance themes into his painting. If you remember, the Renaissance, during the Renaissance, Greco-Roman culture and Greco-Roman literature are elevated to a position almost equal to that of the teachings of the Catholic Church and the Christian worldview. So that these, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Greek mythology, these are ways of finding and appreciating and being more certain, uh, being more certain to the truth, in addition to the Christian worldview. So on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, you do have scenes from the book of Genesis and you've got the Old Testament prophets. Here you've got the prophet Jonah. You can tell it's Jonah by the fish that's immediately by him. Um, in the book of Jonah, he's supposed to go to the city of Nineveh. He flees on a ship. Eventually he's swallowed up by a great fish, and that's what Michelangelo has painted here. And that great fish deposits Jonah back on the shorelines of the eastern Mediterranean, and he goes to the city of Nineveh. So on one side you've got these biblical figures, the prophets, and on the other side, you have the Sibyls. The Sibyls 
were uh, <clears throat> oracles and prophets and uh, prophetic writings in the city of Rome. You also had oracles scattered throughout the Mediterranean world in Greece and Persia. But in the Roman period, they would consult the sibyls in various um, uh, prophetic writings that the sibyls had left in times of great crisis. And so here you can see the sibyls being elevated to a position of truth, a position of authority, almost equal to that of the Old Testament prophets, considering they, that Michelangelo places them on the Sistine Chapel, um, almost juxtaposing the sibyls with the Old Testament's prophets. It's still an astounding, astoundingly beautiful work of art, and one that by looking at it, you can learn some of those key themes of the Renaissance that much more. Now, let's take a look at some questions from Renaissance art. Question one, how did art change from the ancient world to the medieval world? Question two, how did art change from the medieval world to the Renaissance? Question three, what is perspective? What is a fresco? And question four, who is your favorite artist or artwork from this period, and why did you like them so much? Take a moment to answer these questions in your journal now. Thank you.